Greetings, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray that all is well with you and your family and your ministries. And we continue to pray that God will bless you and keep you. And especially in these challenging times, to keep you safe. We want to thank you for joining us in our Greater First Church Baptist uh, ministries, uh, especially those who are concerned about our intercessory prayer ministry that takes place Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 11 o'clock a.m. from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. I mean, it's an extraordinary hour of power. And if you want to engage in that powerful prayer experience with some very faithful prayer warriors uh, from our church and others from around the nation. Uh, we want you to uh, tune in to our website and you can get the call-in information. That's the Greater First Church Baptist here in Baker, Louisiana. Here in Louisiana, we call this area, this is just North uh, Baton Rouge. God bless you. We also want you to know uh, that we're grateful for those who continue to pray uh, for our ministry uh, as we too as a church are making our way back uh, to our facilities as we uh, continue to practice uh, uh, safe distancing and the social distancing and getting the vaccines and just getting ready uh, to come back to our properties and so we want uh, all of you to make sure that you do what is necessary to stay safe, to stay healthy, so that God's people, amen, can worship as we do uh, in terms of our gathering together uh, once again. Feel free to join us in what is also a great blessing on Thursday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. You can join us in our Greater First Church worship and our Bible study fellowship. We have been blessed in our New Testament studies uh, on the letters of, of Peter and John and James and looking at Paul's letters. Uh, it has really been a truly extraordinary experience of faith in action. And I want you to feel free to also join us. You can find that uh, call-in information and join us on Zoom. Uh, we thank God we can look at each other now on Zoom. Uh, you can sign up on our website. Again, that's www.gfcbaker.com. God bless you. As we know, we're in our uh, Easter celebration. Last week has been a whole week of just focusing uh, on Jesus' passion. Uh, and, and the whole mission and ministry of our church. And uh, on today, of course, this is our great celebration day. This is Victory Sunday for God's church in terms of Jesus himself uh, fulfilling God's purpose to bring us into fellowship with him. Yes, he died on Friday on that cross of Calvary as we shared on Good Friday. Uh, but also on the third day, we celebrate the fact that he was raised from the dead and given all power in his hand. And so we're excited today uh, to share with you on this Easter Sunday morning a word from the Lord. Would you turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24? And beginning at verse 44 in Luke's extraordinary text of the gospel writers, Luke is my favorite as it is for many. But Luke also has a sensitivity for the poor and the dispossessed, uh, for women and their needs. And, and I, I'm just so moved by how Luke uh, presents his gospel to all people. Verse 44 and reading today from the English Standard Version of the Bible, it says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses to these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Amen. And from the text of Luke, I want to talk today on this Easter Sunday morning about a change. Is going to come. A change is going to come. Why don't you look at your neighbor, the person you're with, even in this moment, and look at each other and say, Neighbor, the preacher is going to preach about a change is going to come. Amen. What a word from the Lord. And I love how Luke presents that whole story. As he talks about what happens on a road called Emmaus. For after the crucifixion and after the resurrection, help me Holy Spirit, the Bible says that there were two disciples who were walking on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Emmaus, if you will, is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And while they were walking, the Bible says they were sad. Their heads were down. They were pondering upon the death of Jesus. And they were saying to themselves and to one another, we had hoped that he would be the one. We would hope that Jesus would be that Messiah who would deliver Israel, God's people. Uh, they were sad. Their heads were down. And the Bible says that this resurrected Christ, Jesus the Christ, appeared walking with them on the road to Emmaus. <laughs> and something extraordinary happened on that road because when Jesus start speaking to them and uh, ask them, why are you so sad? Why, why are your heads down? Why are you acting like your burden is heavy? And they say, are you a stranger here and you don't know what things have happened in the last three days? And I love that reply, Jesus, he feigns ignorance in order to get them to talk. And Jesus says, what thing? And they began to share with him about uh, Jesus' suffering and death on Calvary's cross. And, and, and they kept on walking. And then Jesus began to tell them some things in terms of the scriptures. Well, he opened up the scriptures and started reminding them that it was written that the Messiah was to suffer and he was to be crucified on yonder cross and that he would rise victoriously, amen, to fulfill God's plan of redemption. Oh yes, and, and the Bible says that they got to their, their, their home or where they were going and when they got there, they were tired and they urged Jesus to stay with them because it was getting late. And the Bible says that while they were sitting at table, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And it was in the process of that blessing and handling of that bread that the Bible says those disciples' eyes were opened. And they realized who it was who was in their midst. And, and
and they were excited because they had experienced the resurrected Christ. And let me add, my brothers and sisters, whenever you talk about the resurrection, you got to also include power. Jesus was resurrected with power. And, 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 and the Bible says that Jesus, of course, he removed himself. He disappeared from them. And, and they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within? As that man spoke to us, that Christ, that Savior, spoke to us along the way. And isn't it something, my brothers and sisters, that sometimes we find ourselves on that Emmaus road? Oftentimes we're looking at our conditions and our circumstances, our economic situations, our our brokenness in our families, uh, this pandemic that, that had us so anxious and so broken and, and, and the anger and, and, the, and the hate all around this nation. Oftentimes we're walking down an Emmaus road with our heads down. Some of us even moving towards a dungeon of despair. Caught up in your cage of complacency, looking at your problems. And then that's when we need to hear the voice of Jesus speaking to our hearts and reminding us that he's able to open up our eyes. God will open up your eyes when you're in your dungeon of despair. God will open that door for you to find your escape. And so, and so that is the, the, the historical existential setting that we find our text situated in. Jesus, of course, is presented in the text by Luke. It's not only the Messiah, but also Lord, also Son of God. And also our Redeemer. And the Bible says that after Jesus removed themselves from those two disciples, Clopas was one of them, Jesus appeared among his 11 disciples. Oh, yes. But notice, if you please, this is what happens when you come in contact with Jesus. You get excited. Something happens to you. And when he blesses you, you can't keep it to yourself. And the Bible says those two disciples that Jesus met on the road to Emmaus, they didn't just go to bed that night, but the Bible says in that same hour, they ran back to Jerusalem. <laughs> met with those 11 disciples and the others who were there and said, we seen him. We are witnesses to this resurrected Christ. And guess what happens? The Bible says Jesus shows up again. And now he appears among all of his disciples. And of course, many of those disciples were scared. <laughs> they thought they had seen a ghost, the Bible says. And so Jesus has to reassure them of who he was, that he was not a figment of their imagination, that he was not a fairy tale, that he was not some, some trumped up uh, fanatic, but he was the son of God. And brothers and sisters, every now and then on our walk of faith, we got to remind people that our religious experience is not a figment of our imagination. It's not something we made up just to get through our trouble. But we have had a personal encounter with the living Savior. And when you come to know who Jesus is, your whole life changes. You got a new way of thinking. You got a new way of speaking. You got a new way of walking. You're walking in a new direction. You're thinking even with a new calculation because something has happened in your life. Do I have 
some help here. Yeah. And, 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 and so Jesus has to assure them of who he is. And look how he does it. He meets them where they are in their physical understanding. And the Bible says, Jesus says, see my hands and, and, and look at my feet. You'll see the, 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 the holes in my hand. You'll see the holes in my feet. If you don't believe that, come on and handle me. Come on, you can touch me, he says. Handle me. And then Jesus says, give me something to eat. Which was the ultimate uh, encouragement to them that he was a living breathing, resurrected Christ. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, on this Easter Sunday morning, we've got to recognize that the resurrection was a historical event. It happened in history. Even other Non-biblical sources attest to the fact that something extraordinary happened on that Friday and on that Sunday morning. <laughs> Even Josephus, the great Jewish historian, he writes about these encounters and these things that the early church had to deal with. The resurrection was real. The resurrection in fact, is the very central element of the apostolic message of Jesus' early church. For in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, it says, Let all the house of Israel know, and let them know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Peter made that testimony. The apostles preached Christ's resurrection not simply as the resuscitation of one who had been dead, but the resurrection as proof and evidence of the fact that God had exalted Jesus to Messiah and Lord. Help me here now. The resurrection at the same time embodies the fact that Jesus' exaltation and enthronement shows and proves that he's not only leader, but he's savior. And so when we talk about Easter Sunday, you, you, you got to deal with the theological meaning of this resurrection. You got to understand that there is the necessity of the resurrection. And there are three points I want to make and I'll be done. But the first necessity of this resurrection of Jesus Christ is understand or understood in order to make possible the forgiveness of sins. In 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verse 17. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, help me here, then your faith is in vain and you are still in your sins. Now, now take a look at that now. It says, if, if, if there is no resurrection, if, 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 if you think it's, 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 a, it's a fable or a fairy tale, then your very faith is in vain. In other words, it's saying the whole Christian faith and its reality and its efficacy is due to the fact that the resurrection is real. And if Christ has not been raised, then grandma's faith is in vain. If Christ has not been raised, then granddaddy's walk with Christ is in vain. We need
need to understand the implication of, of how, how, how necessary the resurrection was and is in the life of God's people and his church. It makes possible the forgiveness of our sins. The second necessity of the resurrection is to afford justification for all believers. What do you mean, brother preacher? Well, to justify means to make right. That, that word, diakasune, the righteousness of God, it means that God's righteousness is imparted unto us. We take on a part of God's righteousness. We're not righteous of our own, but we are partakers of the very nature of God. And therefore, we have been justified, which means we have been made right. We have been put in a right relationship with God all because of the resurrection. There's no victory unless there's a Sunday moment. I wish I had some help here. I, I told you on Good Friday, we got too many Friday fatalists. <laughs> we, we got too many crucifixion cynics. But when you're dealing with faith in God, we've got to have some Sunday shouters instead of some Friday fatalists. Do I have some help here? God's resurrection was necessary in order to make us justified. Paul wrote in Romans 4, 25 and 834, he says, it will be reckoned unto you or to us who believe in him that raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was put to death for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Romans 8, 33 to 35 also gives us some assurances. Romans 8, 33 says, who shall bring and charge against God's people? I mean, who can bring any charges against us? Because it is God who justifies. Paul says, who is to condemn us? It's Christ who died. Yes, it was he who was raised from the dead, who is now at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Verse 35, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or famine or nakedness or peril or pandemic or sword? And he says in verse 39, rhetorically in answer to that question, he says nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so my brothers and my sisters, again, the resurrection Easter Sunday is necessary. I said to make possible the forgiveness of sin and secondly, to afford justification for those of us who believe that Jesus is the Christ of power. And thirdly, it says to furnish a solid basis for Christian hope. That's what the resurrection does. That's what Easter Sunday does. 1 Corinthians 18 and 19 says, if for this life only we have hope in Christ, we of all men most to be pitied. In other words, if you won't have any hope for tomorrow, then you won't have any power for today. He says hope is necessary to keep us moving forward. That's what I wanted to tell you today.
day that a change is going to come. It's going to come in your life. That change is going to come within your family. That change is going to come within our communities. That change is going to come in our nation. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, God's people must have hope and not just in this life. I know we don't talk much about the second coming. We don't talk much about this, this, this eternal reality, this eternal hope that we have that one day God's church will be redeemed. And that we will be with him forever. We must not ever lose that Christian hope. We must understand that life is more than our senses. It's more than just what you see. It's more than what you smell. More than what we taste. More than what we touch. It's more than what we hear. I'm reminded of a sermon by the late great Reverend Manuel Scott Sr. of Dallas, Texas. And I was with him and we were at Mount Calvary Church or Calvary Church in Los Angeles, California. And he preached a sermon called The Passing Parade of Human History. I'll never forget it. And in it, he reminded us, yes, as humans, we've done great things, extraordinary accomplishments. Human history is extraordinary with our literature, with our arts, with William Shakespeare's great writing of Macbeth, John Milton's Paradise Lost, all the way to James Baldwin's the fire next time. And Richard Wright's black boy. Oh, we must understand that there's more to living than just what we experience right here. God says, if you follow me, I'll give you life beyond these shores. I'll give you an existence that you can never fully realize here on these shores. But finally, my brothers and my sisters, Easter Sunday is necessary. The resurrection is necessary in order to fulfill the very scriptures. And that's what Jesus was sharing with those disciples on that road to Emmaus. He said the scriptures must be fulfilled. The scriptures verify who I am. Oh, yes, he says, the scriptures, the law, the prophets, and the writings, which includes the Psalms and the Proverbs, they all talk about this Christ. Moses, in the law, reminded us that God said, I am that I am. That I'm a God of eminence, but I'm also a God of transcendence. And I'm going to come down and save my people from their sins. You tell Pharaoh that I've heard the cry of my people. I've seen their affliction because of their taskmasters. I know of their suffering. And tell Pharaoh, I'm not sending my dead. I'm not sending Raphael, my other angel, but I've decided to come down and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Aren't you glad that God shows up? Aren't you glad he's not a figment of your imagination? Aren't you glad that he knows how much you can bear? The law of Moses, the prophets. Ezekiel said he's a will in the middle of a will. Jeremiah says he's a battle axe 
in the time of trouble. And Isaiah says that Jesus, this Messiah, is a suffering servant. Oh yes, it was Isaiah who wrote. For unto us <laughs> a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus showed up that one day the child was going to be born. He'll go to the cross and he'll redeem humankind. That's why the Proverbs and the Psalms also remind us that the Lord is our shepherd and that we shall not want. Jesus said to his disciples as he also says to us I told you once before that I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but he came to fulfill it. He says, I told you, and you all remember that I am the Logos and the Sarkos. I am the word that has become flesh. He says, yes, I told you that I am the light that shines in darkness. I told you that I am the good shepherd who will offer you protection, provisions, and my presence. I told you that I am the door of a sheep. I am the living water. I am the bread and the life. But if you don't hear anything else that I've said here today, you need to remember that Jesus says that I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one can come to the Father except to come by me. Can I get a witness? Jesus says, I told you that Christ must suffer on a Friday, <laughs> but on the third day, he shall rise from the dead. And I'm glad that Friday came along. I'm glad that he died only on the cross. I'm glad that he would not come down from the cross just to save himself. But Jesus decided to die and to save you and me. And therefore, I'm like uh, Roberta Martin wrote uh, that I am so grateful. Is there anybody here that can follow with me and say I am so grateful that Christ is in my life? What would my life be without him? It would be very dark and grim. Because when I'm sad, Jesus cheers me. When I'm lonely, he will comfort me. That's why I'm grateful. I said I'm truly grateful. I'm so grateful that Christ is in my life. And I gotta close here, but I wanna tell the people of God about this kingdom message. Yeah, it says, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, because God will take care of you. Beneath his wings, yeah, of love abide. You ought to tell somebody, God will take care of you. 
Do I have a witness here? God will take care of you through every day, over all the way. He will meet you where you are. He will wake you up in the morning. He will give you protection all day long. I heard my grandma used to say, it's all night and it's all day. The angels, thank you Jesus, keeps a watching over me. Thank God for the resurrection. Thank God for Easter. Thank God that we have hope. Not only for today, but hope that better things are going to come. As I close here, I just want to remind you that your change is going to come. Let us pray. Thank you, Holy Jesus, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for your redemption that you provided for that word that became flesh in the person of Jesus, the Christ of power. Thank you now, Lord, for enriching our lives with this hope. And we ask you right now, God, to give us the power and the empowerment we need to move forward, to get up from where we are and to move forward in hope, move forward in our faith and move forward in our freedom. In Jesus the Christ, the power's name we pray. Let the church say, Amen. Amen and Amen. And remember, as I told you before, one of my former pastors, the late great Reverend Floyd Preston Piper of the First Baptist Church of Chicago used to say, repeat after me, I'm not many, but I am one. I can't do all things, but I can do some. And that I can do, God expects me to. And remember, my brothers and my sisters, don't let the devil Steal your joy.